the new STEMI guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, my name is Frans van der Werf and I was uh, the chair of the task force of the previous guidelines, uh, the STEMI guidelines of 2008 and it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, the co-chairs of this uh, session, Gabriel Stech uh, sitting next to me, and also Stefan James who is coming within a few minutes, and they have been the chairs of this uh, new set of guidelines. And I uh, leave it now to uh, Gabriel Stech to introduce uh, the first uh, speaker. Yes, before we do so, uh, I want to make a, a couple of uh, comments. First of all, this session is being live streamed, and uh, so it can be viewed online in real time, and it will be included after the Congress into uh, ESC Congress 365, so it can be uh, made available online to a worldwide audience. And therefore, uh, this means that any question that will be asked uh, should be asked using the microphones, so that it can be uh, uh, recorded for the online audience as well. We will try to have four presentations of approximately 17 to 18 minutes and then we will have two to four minutes after each presentation for a few questions at the microphones. Uh, without further delay, we are going to uh, review the, um, the background and details of the new EST STEMI guidelines and we've divided the work in four and Doron Zager from Israel will start by presenting the early management and reperfusion strategies. Doron. Thank you, Gabriel. Distinguished chairs, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege and honor to present on behalf of the task force, the section on early management and reperfusion strategies of the new ESC STEMI guidelines. These are my disclosures. What is new in the field of early management and reperfusion strategies in the document? Early diagnosis has, has an expanded section with specific recommendations added. The topic of cardiac arrest is the focus of an expanded section with the role of therapeutic hypothermia and angiography now defined. The hospital logistics of care have, are a focus of a much expanded section with the role of pre-hospital diagnosis, triage, and networks highlighted. In terms of reperfusion strategies, there are modified recommended maximal time delays, as we shall see. Starting with initial diagnosis, the first recommendations are not a deviation from the previous document. A 12 lead ECG must be obtained as soon as possible at the point of FMC with a target delay of 10 minutes or less. ECG monitoring must be initiated as soon as possible in all patients with suspected STEMI. These are both class one level of evidence B recommendations. Blood sampling for serum markers is recommended routinely in the acute phase, but one should not wait, of course, for the results to initiate a perfusion, another class one recommendation. A uh, modification of the previous version states that the use of additional posterior chest wall leads in patients with high suspicion of infrabasal myocardial infarction, including, um, suggesting circumflex occlusion, should be considered. This is a 2A level of evidence C recommendation. Echo may assist in making the diagnosis in uncertain cases, but should not delay transfer for angiography. The document spent some time uh, discussing the pitfalls for the diagnosis of STEMI. And left bundle branch block is, of course, an important such pitfall. Despite published algorithms, the diagnosis of the mind patients with left bundle branch block remains difficult. And concordant ST elevation appears one of the best indicators of ongoing ischemia. The, documented, the document stresses that most patients presenting to the emergency department with the left bundle branch block do not have an acute coronary occlusion, nor do they need primary PCI. Nevertheless, if there is clinical suspicion of ongoing ischemia, prompt reperfusion therapy should be considered, preferably by primary PCI, to avoid unnecessary thrombolysis in a patient who does not have acute arterial occlusion. A point-of-care high-sensitivity troponin assay may prove useful in such borderline cases. Other diagnostic pitfalls include posterior infarction, which we already mentioned, and posterior leads should be recorded routinely 
Ongoing ischemia despite medical therapy is an indication for emergency coronary angiography even in the absence of diagnostic ST segment elevation. The presence of ST depression of 0.1 millivolt or more in eight or more leads plus ST elevation in AVR and or V1 suggests left main or equivalent multivessel obstruction. For relief of pain, breathlessness, and anxiety, recommendations are generally similar to the previous version with a change made in the recommendation for oxygen. Oxygen is now indicated in patients with hypoxia, defined as a saturation of 95% or less, breathlessness or acute heart failure. This is a class one level of evidence C recommendation. The document stresses that routine administration of oxygen beyond these uh, subsets is at best of uncertain value. The topic of cardiac arrest is the focus of new recommendations. All medical and paramedical personnel caring for a patient with suspected MI must have access to defibrillation equipment and be trained to cardiac life support. This is an obvious class one level of evidence C recommendation. It is recommended to initiate ECG monitoring at the point of FMC in all patients with suspected MI. Another class one. A new recommendation, therapeutic hypothermia is indicated early after resuscitation of cardiac arrest patients who are comatose or in deep sedation, a class one level of evidence B recommendation. Immediate angiography with a view to primary PCI is recommended in patients with resuscitated cardiac arrest whose ECG shows STEMI, this is class one. And immediate angiography with a view to primary PCI should, all, should be considered a class 2A recommendation in survivors of cardiac arrest without diagnostic ST elevation, but those who have high suspicion of ongoing infarction, such as patients who sustained substantial chest pain before their collapse. The discussion of time delays starts with the definition of a number of important point, time points and time intervals. The document defines symptom onset, first medical contact, diagnosis, and onset of reperfusion. For patients proceeding to receive thrombolytic therapy, the onset of reperfusion therapy is obviously the moment at which intravenous administration of thrombolysis begins. For those proceeding to primary PCI, the task force felt it would be more appropriate to choose wire passage than balloon inflation as the time at which reperfusion therapy starts. This is to acknowledge the fact that many uh, operators pre perform aspiration thrombectomy, and since the time to beginning of PCI is a quality benchmark, it would be more appropriate to use wire passage as that uh, point in time. Out of these time points, there are time intervals which are derived from them. There is patient delay between symptom onset and FMC, FMC to diagnosis, which would not exceed 10 minutes, system delay between first medical contact and reperfusion, and total ischemic time or time to reperfusion therapy between symptom onset and onset of reperfusion. The documents highlights and stresses the importance of organizational aspects of STEMI care and highlights the role of emergency medical systems. A unique, well-recognized telephone number for EMS is important. It is not available currently in all European countries, but is important. Teleconsultation between EMS and the cardiology center is ideal, but not widely available. Pre-hospital diagnosis, triage, and initial management increase the use of reperfusion therapy and reduce time delays. Therefore, EMS is the preferred mode of transport and initial care for STEMI patients. Properly trained paramedical personnel can effectively diagnose STEMI and provide timely reperfusion. Physician manned ambulances are available in only a few countries in Europe, but they are not necessary for effective pre-hospital management of STEMI. A pre-hospital EKG interpreted either by well-trained paramedical teams in the field or teletransmitted to cardiology center before hospital admission greatly accelerates in-hospital management subsequently and reduces reperfusion delays. There is substantial experience from a number of European countries, such as Austria, Poland, France, Sweden, and others, 
regarding the use of regional STEMI networks to facilitate reperfusion. And this experience has clearly shown that regional STEMI networks increase the proportion of patients who eventually receive reperfusion therapy and increases the proportion of those patients who will have primary PCI. It also reduces time delays. Therefore, networks um, are uh, specified in the document to some extent. And the document uh, identifies the characteristics of a successful STEMI network. Such networks should have a clear definition of a geographical areas of responsibility. There should be shared protocols based on risk stratification and transportation by trained paramedic staff in appropriately equipped ambulances or helicopters. Pre-hospital triage of STEMI patients to the appropriate institutions. Bypassing non-PCI hospitals whenever primary PCI can be implemented within the recommended time limits. On arrival at the appropriate hospital, the patient should immediately be taken to the catheterization laboratory, bypassing the emergency department. Patients presenting to a non-PCI capable hospital and awaiting transportation for primary or rescue PCI must be attended in an appropriately monitored and staffed area. If the diagnosis of STEMI has not been made by the ambulance crew and the ambulance arrives at a non-PCI capable hospital, the ambulance should wait for diagnosis and if STEMI is confirmed, should continue to a PCI capable hospital. These principles translate into the following guideline recommendations. Ambulance teams must be trained and equipped to identify STEMI with use of ECG recorders and telemetry as necessary and administer initial therapy, including thrombolysis, where applicable. The pre-hospital management of STEMI patients must be based on regional networks designed to deliver a perfusion therapy expeditiously and effectively with efforts made to make primary PCI available to as many patients as possible. Primary PCI capable centers must deliver a 24-7 service. If you perform primary PCI, you should perform it 24-7 and be able to start primary PCI as soon as possible, but always within 60 minutes from the initial call. And we will go back to this time frame in just a minute. These are all class one level of evidence B recommendations. All hospitals and EMS participating in the care of patients with STEMI must record and monitor delay times and work to achieve and maintain the following quality targets. FMC to ECG less than 10 minutes, FMC to reperfusion for lysis less than 30 minutes, for primary PCI less than 90 minutes, but less than 60 if the patient presents within two hours of symptom onset or directly to a PCI capable hospital. We will go back to those in a minute. All EMS, emergency departments, and coronary care units must have a written updated STEMI management protocol, preferably shared within geographic networks. Patients presenting to a non-PCI capable hospital and awaiting transportation for primary rescue PCI must be attended in an appropriately monitored area. These are all class one recommendations. Patients transferred to a PCI capable center for primary PCI should bypass the emergency department and be transferred directly to the catheterization laboratory. This is a 2A level of evidence B recommendation. This slide summarizes the strategic approach to reperfusion recommended by the new document. Once ST elevation MI is diagnosed, the algorithm now is different if the patient initially presents to a primary PCI capable center or elsewhere. If the patient initially presents to a primary PCI capable center, they should have primary PCI within 60 minutes. This is the new time interval recommended by the guidelines. If the patient presents elsewhere, such as EMS or a non-primary PCI capable center, the first question to be asked now is whether or not PCI is possible elsewhere within 120 minutes. This is the decision point. This is the decision time limit uh, provided or suggested by the guidelines. If primary PCI cannot be performed within two hours, then patients should have immediate fibrinolysis within 30 minutes. If PCI is possible within two hours, the patient should, immediately, should be immediately transferred to a PCI-capable center for primary PCI. 
This should be performed preferably within 90 minutes and even within 60 minutes in early presenters. One should distinguish between the decision limit, which is two hours, and the target time to PCI, which is less. So it is acceptable to perform primary PCI within two hours rather than thrombolysis, but that is not the ideal delay to primary PCI. If the patient had thrombolysis, they should immediately be transferred to a PCI center without delay and without waiting the outcome of thrombolysis. If the patient had successful thrombolysis, then they should have coronary angiography within 3 to 24 hours with a view to PCI as necessary. If fibrinolysis has not been successful, the patient should immediately be taken for rescue angioplasty. The slide translates into the following guideline recommendations. Reperfusion therapy is indicated in all patients with symptoms of 12 hours or less and persistent ST elevation or presumed new LBBB, the classic class 1A recommendation. Change of wording from the previous document, reperfusion therapy, preferably primary PCI, is indicated if there is evidence of ongoing ischemia, even if symptoms may have started more than 12 hours beforehand, or if pain and ECG changes have been stuttering. This is a class one level of evidence C recommendation. Reperfusion therapy with primary PCI may be considered in stable patients without pain, presenting 12 to 24 hours after symptom onset. This is a class 2B level of evidence B recommendation based on one study. Routine PCI of a totally occluded artery beyond the first 24 hours from symptom onset in stable patients without signs of ischemia, regardless of whether fibrinolysis had been given or not, is not recommended. This slide summarizes the important delays and treatment goals in the management of acute STEMI. Preferred for FMC to ECG and diagnosis is 10 minutes or less. FMC to lysis, so-called FMC to needle, less than 30 minutes. Preferred for FMC to primary PCI, what used to be called door to balloon and maybe should be now renamed door to wire, in primary PCI hospitals is 60 minutes or less. Preferred for FMC to primary PCI is less than 90 minutes, but less than 60 minutes if the patient presents early or there's a large area at risk. Acceptable for primary PCI rather than lysis is less than two hours and less than 90 minutes in early presenters or large area at risk. Preferred for successful fibrinolysis to angiography, three to 24 hours. So what are the take home messages of this segment of the guideline? In terms of early management, use regional networks. Initial triage and management should be done by EMS. Paramedical staff performs very well. In terms of perfusion strategies, PCI is preferred over thrombolysis if it can be performed within 120 minutes, but efforts must be made to stay under 90 minutes. In PCI-capable centers, maximal FMC to balloon time should not exceed 60 minutes. And there is a class one recommendation for PCI or perfusion if there is evidence of ischemia even beyond the traditional 12 hours. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have four minutes for a few questions. If you have questions, please go to the microphones and introduce yourself. Can I ask a question? So sometimes there is some confusion about first medical contact. Uh, would you accept the, uh, the knowledge that we can replace that by the diagnostic ECG? We actually discussed this and felt that diagnosis, since we want to define the maximum time, time delay to diagnosis, we should include the time to reaching the diagnosis within this chain of events. So we said 10 minutes from FMC to diagnosis to stress that you need to do that expeditiously. Okay. Looks uh, two questions. How do you address for stuttering ischemia when you are not sure about it and then it comes and goes like that how are we going to evaluate two in patients of diabetes where you are not knowing about the onset of infarction 
how you address them? Well, these are two good questions. Regarding stuttering ischemia, um, I think uh, we have the recommendation uh, here, the second recommendation, the perfusion therapy is indicated, class one recommendation, if there's evidence of ongoing ischemia, even if symptoms may have started, uh, and, and even if pain and ECG changes have been stuttering. So if you think the patient is currently still ischemic, even if the course has been stuttering, then you should proceed to primary PCI. And of course, in many patients, the onset of symptoms is unclear, and we should rely on our best clinical judgment and, and often the ECG uh, to decide whether or not the patient may still benefit from a perfusion. Okay, well, if there's no other question, then uh, we will move on to the next presenter. Pleased to, to welcome, I'm, ple I'm pleased to welcome up to the podium Dr. Arno van Hoof from Zwolle, the Netherlands, uh, who will talk about the next se section of the guideline document uh, about primary percutaneous coronary intervention and adjunctive pharmacology. Welcome, Arno. Thank you, Franz, Stefan, and James, dear ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the task force on the new 2012 STEMI guidelines, it's a privilege to present to you some data on the procedural aspects of primary PCI in STEMI and also on adjunctive pharmacotherapy. These are my disclosures for this presentation. The previous speaker just pointed out that primary PCI according to these 2012 guidelines, is a class 1A recommendation for the treatment of STEMI. However, provided it can be performed, ideally within 60 minutes after first medical contact, and definitely within 120 minutes after the patient arrives at the hospital. And this is important data uh, another class one recommendation is the fact that primary PCI is indicated for patients with severe acute heart failure or cardiogenic shock unless the expected PCI related delay is excessive and the patients present early after symptom onset. And the previous speaker already pointed out that logistics are very important in this regard and especially to these patients with acute heart failure. I now want to highlight some procedural aspects of primary PCI. An important recommendation of the new guidelines is that primary PCI should be limited to the culprit vessel with the exception of cardiogenic shock and persistent ischemia after PCI of the supposed culprit lesion. And this is based on a, it's given a 2A recommendation and not 1 because the results from only small randomized trials have been conflicting. However, the results from registries have all shown that primary PCI should be limited to the culprit vessel only in the acute phase. Another new recommendation of this guideline is access site. And it states that if performed by an experienced radial operator, radial access should be preferred over femoral access. And this is an important recommendation given a class 2A level of evidence B recommendation. And this is mainly, it's not a class 1 recommendation because the results from the rival study were negative with regard to the advantage of radial access. Both the primary and secondary endpoint of bleeding were not statistically significant. However, when you look at the rival de data in detail, one can appreciate that there was a significant interaction between the type of ACS in which especially STEMI patients had a benefit from radial access. And also people or 
operators who were highly experienced in the radio procedure were uh, shown to be an effective uh, or a real benefit in patients treated via the radio artery. The answer came from the rival ST elevation ACS study, which was a study in 1001 STEMI patient, specifically addressing the excess site in STEMI patient. And this study really showed a significant advantage of radial access in fa uh, uh, with regard to the primary endpoint, and also the secondary endpoint of death was significantly reduced. Run new class 3 recommendation I want to highlight. And this is the routine use of an intraortic below pump in patients without shock. And this, has been, this is now a class 3 recommendation, mainly based on the results of the CRISP AMI trial recently published in JAMA, showing that in patients with large anterior MI, the use of routine use of intraortic balloon pump did not reduce uh, infarct size addressed by magnetic resonance imaging. And it even showed that infarct size was somewhat higher in the patients who were treated with intraortic balloon pump. And the downside of the treatment was an increased, increased rate of bleeding. With regards to pharmacotherapy, the guidelines really uh, were um, in consistent with the recent published non-STEMI guidelines. It tells that aspirin should be given to everybody with STEMI, either oral or preferably intravenously. And with regards to the new ADP receptor blockers, Prazugrel is a class 1B recommendation in clopidogrel naive patients. However, they should not have a history of prior stroke TIA or have an age above 75 years. Also, Tagagalor has got a 1B recommendation in STEMI patients. And clopidogrel should be reserved for patients in which prazugrel or Tagagalor is either not available or contraindicated. And these data come from the specific data of the Triton TIMI 38 STEMI substudy, which was a predefined substudy in the Triton study. And this study showed that the primary endpoint in the STEMI patient was significantly in favor of the patients treated with prazugrel. And in this study, the use of prazugrel was not associated with an increased risk of bleeding. Also, the substudy of PLATO uh, with regard to the use of Ticagalor in STEMI showed comparable results. And although the primary endpoint was not significantly in favor of Ticagalor, results were very consistent with the overall PLATO results. And again, showing that the use of Ticagalor in STEMI patients did not uh, increase the risk of bleeding. Another important recommendation with regards to pharmacotherapy is that when you think about giving anticoagulants in patients undergoing primary PCI, you should give an injectable anticoagulant. There come more and more data that oral agents in the acute phase of, primer, of, of STEMI is less effective. So with regard to the oral antiplatelet agents, we know that the onset of action of an agent like Prazugrel or Tagagalor is more early as compared to the onset of action of Clopidogrel. However, these results come from studies in stable CAD patients or healthy volunteers, and we know from the recent work of Marco Falcimigli in the fabulous PRO study that even a quick agent or a fast onset agent like Prazugrel takes more than two hours to give a level of uh, platelet aggregation inhibition which is um, optimal. So even in STEMI patients, 60 milligrams of Prazugrel might only become effective after two hours of pretreatment therefore suggesting that injectable agents are preferably used in STEMI patients in the first couple of minutes or hours of treatment. An important recommendation is the use of bivalerudin, and it is recommended over the use of unfractionated heparin together with a GP2B3A inhibitor, 
uh, class 1b recommendation. And this data come mainly from the Horizons uh, AMI study, and we all know that the short-term benefit is known, but recently also the long-term benefit was shown with a, uh, with a consistent mortality benefit in favor of the use of bivalirudin in these patients, suggesting that the prevention of bleeding really translates into an improvement of clinical outcome. Enoxaparin is new in the new STEMI guidelines, saying that enoxaparin with or without the use of 2B3 inhibitors may be preferred over unfractionated heparin. And this is a class 2B level of evidence B recommendation, and it's not a 2A recommendation because the results of the Atoll study did not find a significant difference in favor of enoxaparin. However, there was a very strong trend in the primary endpoint in favor of enoxaparin. All key secondary endpoints showed, however, a significant benefit of enoxaparin over unfractionated heparin. A meta-analysis showed that uh, the use of enoxaparin was associated with uh, improved clinical outcome. With regards to the use of 2B3 inhibitors, there's a change of the guideline in comparison to the 2010 uh, revascularization guidelines of the ESC. In that guideline, the upstream use of 2B3 inhibitors was recommended as a class three recommendation. However, this was updated to a class two recommendation in these new guidelines, saying that the upstream use of 2B3 inhibitors versus in-lab use may be considered in high-risk patients undergoing transfer for primary PCI. And this is mainly based on the recent meta-analysis of the Egypt Corporation saying that the early use of 2B3 inhibitors in STEMI patients is associated with a two-fold increase in the, um, in the patency of the infarctulated vessel before PCI. And this also translated in improved clinical outcome in patients of the on time two pulled analysis recently published. One thing which is, which is often forget in the acute treatment of STEMI patients is the use of intravenous beta blockers. And now it states that intravenous beta blockers should be considered at the time of presentation in patients without contraindications, with high blood pressure, tachycardia, and no signs of heart failure. I think this is an important recommendation and, as I said, is often forgotten in the acute phase. Also, we want to highlight recommendation in special subsets of patients. And I, I want to emphasize this recommendation that special attention must be given to proper dosing of antithrombotics in the elderly and the renal failure patients, which is a class 1B recommendation. And of course, this has to do with the higher bleeding risk in these high-risk patients. And the, the new guidelines also emphasize that in these patients, you should use a kind of um, bleeding risk calculator in order to differentiate your treatment uh, with regards to the bleeding risk. And the Crusade risk score might help you in tailoring treatment, not only for dose, but also for the type of treatment and the type of anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy you're going to give. I, like, I want to thank you for your attention. There, there's now time for, for questions from the audience. Uh, please step up to the microphone, introduce yourself, and, and uh, challenge Arno and, and us with your questions. Meanwhile, I'd like to come back, Arno. You skipped the issue about DS versus BMS. Uh, we had a great deal of discussion within the guideline committee, and that created also some controversy. Could you please comment on the recommendation? I think um, it's... Um uh, it's an important aspect which drug, which, um, uh, uh, whether you should give a bare metal stent or a drug eluting stent in, in these patients. 90% of patients are receiving a stent. In the previous guidelines, the drug eluting stent was still, especially the first generation drug eluting stents, were uh, related to, to the hazard of uh, stent thrombosis. Uh, 
Now, more and more data came up with uh, the safe use, especially of the second generation drug eluting stents. It has now become a, um, um, a, um, an upgrade of recommendation for the use of drug eluting stents in, in STEMI patients. However, um, of course, there's still some debate. It's still not a class one recommendation, but it's still, it's, uh, it's really a, um, uh, an uh, upgrade of the use of drug eluting stent in, in STEMI patients. And um, so that's why um, this, uh, this is a new recommendation. Maybe I can add and explain that the committee felt that improvement of repeat target vessel revascularization and a reduction in risk stenosis, which is clearly afforded by drug eluting stent, is a nice clinical outcome, but it is not the yardstick by which therapies are judged in acute myocardial infarction. And generally, generally most therapies that have a recommendation of class one are therapies that reduce mortality or heart outcomes. And we don't have proof that drug eluting stents impact heart clinical outcomes yet. In fact, as you know, there's been some concerns regarding the long-term safety, which is actually why even now newer large-scale large trials are still exploring the issue of drug eluting stent versus bare metal stent in acute myocardial infarction. However, the committee felt reassured by most of the data regarding the one year safety of these devices and therefore uh, recommended a 2A level uh, for drug eluting stents. There are several questions, so we will start here. I am Dr. Chokalingam. Do you have any place where do you exhibit triple track therapy for this acute intervention? Um, you mean triple antiplatelet therapy or? Yes. Yes. I think it. it it depends. Um, uh, as I pointed out, uh, you only have got short time to pre-treat patients in, in, in the STEMI situation. Um, when the situation is ideal, the ambulance might, uh, might make the diagnosis, and from this transportation time to the primary PCI center, you've got around one hour of pre-treatment time. And uh, with the intravenous agents, they should be expected to work immediately. However, with the oral agents, it's important uh, that we get more data on the efficacy of these new agents like Prasugrel and Tigacolor. Are they effective at the moment of primary PCI, yes or no? The moment we do not yet know whether these new agents uh, really are effective within one or two hours after the oral administration, you should give intravenous agents on top of that. And it might either be bivalorudin or an oxyparin or perhaps a 2B3A inhibitor, which uh, indeed is effective within a few minutes after the intravenous administration. So that's, that's the issue in the acute phase. And of course, a few hours after the oral administration of these agents, you will expect these uh, agents to become effective and then you can stop the intravenous administration. Okay, the next question here. Thank you for your presentation. I have a similar question. Uh, do you agree the, to give uh, pre-hospital sitting uh, loading dose prasugrel or ticagrel and in the ambulance? I really would recommend that. Of course, you do not know whether it's really working at the moment of primary PCI, but at least you give it earlier as compared to the administration inside the hospital. So I would really recommend to administer these agents as early as possible, but you do not know whether it's already effective at the moment you perform your primary PCI. But I would really recommend it to give it in the ambulance as early as possible. Donald Latch from Australia. I'm just wondering there was a mortality advantage with Ticagrelor over Prasugrel. Would you not recommend that over Prasugrel in STEMI patients then? I think, uh, the, the, of course, um, the, the issue of the mortality benefit in Plato is an important issue. However, the uh, mechanistic um, benefit of both drugs is more or less the same. They, they uh, have higher platelet aggregation inhibition. Uh, resulting in the reduction of stent thrombosis and um, uh, improvement of uh, thrombotic, uh, reduction of thrombotic complications. And we do not feel that uh, there's a large difference between the drugs with regard to this efficacy. So we cannot recommend one drug over the other. Can I, can I add a word? I, I think this is an interesting point because there's been a lot of discussion about these 
uh, comparison between trials, and I think generally it's very dangerous to compare across trials because there are so many differences in the design, the agents, and, and the population, and so on and so forth. With respect to the mortality, I think the argument can be played both ways. Indeed, Plato found a mortality reduction with ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel overall in ACS, including STEMI patients, but was not significant for the mortality reduction in the STEMI subset. Conversely, uh, Prazogrel did not reach a mortality reduction overall in the Triton trial, but did find at the pre-specified endpoint of 30 days a mortality reduction in the STEMI subset. And therefore, you can really argue both ways, which is why the committee felt and this is actually consistent with the non-ST elevation ACS recommendations and the revascularization guidelines as well, we also felt that both agents should be recommended with the same level in STEMI. And I state this while being a Plato investigator myself. There's uh, a question in the back. Ali Kaverko from Moscow. What do you think about time delay for estimation of bleeding risk using crusade scale when we try to choose type of stent in primary PCI? Because crusade scale needs some laboratory data which was time consumption. That's a, a good point. Uh, this is, um, of course, Crusade is a, is, a, is a good score. However, it uses creatinine clearance, etc., which is not available at the acute phase of, uh, of STEMI. So you should find um, a more practical bleeding uh, risk in these patients that against comes to, to your clinical judgment when you've got an elderly lady which is... Um, uh, which has a low body weight, etc., uh, has a high risk of bleeding. So in, in the acute phase, when you do not have the real uh, uh, estimation or the real calculation of this bleeding uh, risk, you should uh, judge on your clinical judgment and, and um, uh, w with regards to the type of stent, uh, it's... Um, it's important to, uh, to know whether there's a high bleeding risk and also whether the patient is receiving oral anticoagulation. But the, in the acute phase, I, I agree that the um, crusade bleeding risk uh, is not available. Please no, no, I am that. Dr. Chokalingam from India. In India, we see often now between 18 to 25 years old, they are getting STEMI and one third of them, the coronary arteries are near normal. Where do you stand about our recommendations? <laughs> you mean there's, there's no lesion to treat or do you think there's, uh, there's only one lesion? Or insignificant, maybe about 30% obstruction, 40% obstruction, not significant one to produce at the time when you do investigation. Yeah, may, maybe uh, it, it is, of course, difficult to comment on specific patients, but we know that some patients, particularly young patients who are smokers, may have minimal lesions on angiography that, that actually uh, uh, might be, the mechanism of which might be a thrombus that resolved by the time the patient was taken to angiography. And these patients uh, usually require, of course, control of smoking, potent antithrombotic therapies, and often they will require intervention there's no really definitive evidence on how to manage these lesions that are, quote, non-significant, uh, because they're still ruptured plaques, and many interventionists would tend to stent them. The reason why I asked that question, even though they have got near normal coronaries, the LV dysfunction is continued to going like cardiomyopathy, thereby the ejection fraction coming down to 30, 35, whether this could be due to microvascular disease or, the, as we have been mentioning, the smoking, other risk factors responsible. Yeah, I, I think that we all recognize that ischemic cardiomyopathy is a reality, and some patients may have repeated episodes of myocardial ischemia with atypical presentations. I think they are beyond the scope of the general STEMI guideline, though. See, I'm Dr. Ramesh from India. You now recommended intravenous beta blockers as the class 2B in a people with tachycardia and normal LV function. The choice of beta blocker and the dose of beta blocker, what is then recommended in this guidelines? There's not a specific recommendation on this, um, uh, on this type of, of beta blockers. Of course, you, you want to treat them intravenously and you want to do it short acting because uh, these agents might uh, negatively improve cardiac contractility and when you use long acting agents, uh, this might have a negative effect. So the preference is for the short acting intravenous beta blockers. The dose nothing specific, Dose is not specified. 
Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, then we will move to the third presentation regarding thrombolysis. <laughs> thrombolysis, Adjunctive Pharmacology and Interventions by Fernando Fran Francisco Fernandez Aviles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Before disclosing no uh, conflict of interest, uh, I would like to thank uh, the European Society of Cardiology for inviting me to present the uh, chapter on uh, thrombolysis and associated interventions, which uh, will be focused on three points, thrombolytic drugs, angiography and intervention after thrombolysis, the so-called pharmacoinvasive strategy, and adjunctive antithrombotic therapy. So, starting uh, uh, with the evidence supporting the use of uh, lytics in patients with acute myocardial infarction and ST segment ele elevation, I would like to remind you firstly that uh, the efficacy of this uh, therapy is very well established with a uh, 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 benefit of uh, at least uh, uh, as much as 30 deaths prevented if given early as compared to placebo. But at the price of an incidence of uh, bleeding which varies between 10 and 15 percent and uh, approximately 1 percent of uh, intracranial bleeding, the most serious complication of this therapy, which is uh, independently predicted, which has series of conditions which should be uh, considered very carefully before the administration of this uh, therapy. Advanced age, low weight, female gender, hypertension, and prior stroke. Uh, the type of lytic is uh, also uh, very important determining the risk of bleeding uh, with a higher incidence of uh, uh, intracranial bleeding with the use of uh, TPA as compared to other lytics, as uh, uh, demonstrated in the GASTO-1 trial. However, this study also demonstrated that uh, TPI uh, produced a uh, uh, result in less uh, mortality and less incidence of the uh, uh, combined event stroke and disabling uh, uh, death and disabling stroke with a net benefit of 10 deaths uh, prevented uh, per 1,000 patients treated uh, at the price of, of one stroke. As you can see, uh, there is no difference between uh, fibrin spe specific agents with respect to mortality or intracranial bleeding, although TNK uh, result in less incidence of uh, non cerebral bleeding and uh, uh, need of transfusion. This uh, agent has, in addition, the advantage of a, a very simple and quick administration, uh, we, and this is very important because, as uh, you can see in this uh, figure, the efficacy of thrombolysis is much uh, higher when this th therapy is administered very early, as demonstrated by the uh, classical meta-analysis by Bersner many years ago and uh, in other trials. You can see that in the uh, SN trial there were approximately 25% of infarction aborted when TNK was uh, given during the first hour and concordantly you can see that uh, uh, in this meta-analysis of uh, uh, trials comparing pre-hospital and in-hospital thrombolysis, uh, the uh, administration of the lytic in the pre-hospital setting resulted in shorter delay and uh, uh, lower mortality. So, according with this evidence, the recommendation of the new guidelines regarding thrombolysis are the following. Fibrinolytic therapy is recommended within 12 hours of symptom onset in patients without contraindications if primary PCI cannot be performed by an experienced time within two hours, minutes from first medical uh, contact. This is class one, level A indication. In patients presented early, less than two hours after onset, with a large infarction and low bleeding risk, thrombolysis should be considered if time from first medical contact to balloon inflation is longer than 90 minutes. This indication, class 2A, level B. If possible, thrombolysis should start in the pre-hospital setting, indication 2A, level A. And finally, a fibrin-specific agent is recommended over non-fibrin-specific agents, 1B indication. 
But these are the uh, uh, contraindication of thrombolysis, which include a series of conditions uh, identifying patients with a high uh, absolute of uh, relative risk of uh, intracranial bleeding or vital bleeding. And here you have the list of agents and doses that you can uh, review carefully and in detail in the publication in the European Heart Journal. Then, and regarding the role of pharmacoinvasive strategy, let me remind you some important data. First, uh, you perfectly know that thrombolysis is strongly limited by the risk of a reopening failure and reocclusion. As you uh, know, uh, this happened in uh, 50 and 30 percent of the cases, uh, respectively, and uh, both limitations uh, have a very deleterious effect on prognosis and shown in these two figures. Uh, second, uh, as demonstrated in the REACT trial and other studies, in patients uh, in whom a thrombolysis, uh, 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 there is no evidence of a reopening after thrombolysis, the strategy of performing uh, urgent uh, rescue PCI is better than uh, conserva conservative treatment or, sec or second administration of uh, lytics. And finally, uh, early routine post-thrombolysis PCI uh, has uh, demonstrated to be better than the uh, previously uh, recommended uh, watchful waiting strategy, as uh, demonstrated initially, initially and the, uh, in the Gracia 1 trial and confirmed uh, in a total of eight randomized clinical trials and two uh, meta-analysis involving more than 3,000 patients. Uh, uh, moreover, according to the results of uh, small studies like the Gracia 2 trial and the and the, and, uh, 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 real world observation like the FAST AMI trial, probably this strategy could be equivalent to primary PCI. So. The recommendation regarding uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy in the new guidelines are the following. Transfer of uh, 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 thrombolyzed patients to a, 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 a PCI uh, center is indicated in all patients. Rescue PCI is indicating immediately when thrombolysis has failed uh, uh, because of the persistence of symptoms or because of the evidence of less than 50% ST segment resolution at 60 minutes. This is an indication A1. Emergency PCI is indicated in the case of recurring ischemia or in case of evidence of reocclusion after initial successful thrombolysis. This is indication 1B. Emergency angiography with a view to revascularization is indicated in heart failure or shock patients, indication 1A. Angiography with a view to revascularization of the infarbulated artery is indicated after successful thrombolysis, indication 1A. Optimal timing of angiography for stable patients after successful lysis has been considered to be three, between 3 and 24 hours after thrombolysis, indication 2A. -E -A. And finally, uh, regarding the evidence uh, uh, supporting the use of antithrombotic adjunctive therapy, let me remind you firstly that uh, in the case of antiplatelets, there is no, uh, there is a clear evidence regarding the benefit of uh, uh, aspirin uh, uh, improving the uh, outcome of thrombolyzed patients, with an additional significant benefit when uh, uh, coprilogrel is associated to uh, aspirin as uh, observed in the ACE2 trial, in the common trial, in the and in the clarity trial. Regarding uh, parenteral anticoagulation, what uh, uh, evidence said is that epanin improved outcomes after preventing specific agents uh, with uh, enoxaparin better than uh, fractionated epanin at the price uh, of more non cerebral bleeding, but with a net benefit in favor of enoxaparin. After the use of the estrotokinase, fondapanins has demonstrated to reduce the long term and short term uh, incidence of. Uh, death and uh, infarction. <clears throat> 
So, according to this evidence, the recommendation of the new guidelines in, uh, uh, in, in re with respect to -thrombo uh, antithrombotic therapy are the following. Oral or intravenous aspirin should be administered in all cases, indication 1B. Copidoret is indicated in addition to aspirin, indication 1A. Anticoagulation is recommended in all STEMI patients treated with lytics until revascularization or for the duration of hospital stay up to eight days. And the anticoagulants can be enoxaparin for intravenous followed by, by subcutaneous administration, indication 1A. Uh, and fractionate heparin uh, given as a weight adjusted intravenous bolus and infusion, indication 1C, and in patients treated with streptokinase from the parinus, intravenous uh, should be uh, administered as bolus followed by uh, subcutaneous dose uh, 24 hours later. These uh, are the uh, agents and doses. And this is the summary of the indication regarding uh, recommendation regarding thrombolysis and associated strategies. Thrombolysis is an effective therapy indicated in the absence of contraindication when primary PCI cannot be performed. It should be given very soon, preferably in the pre-hospital setting and with fibrin-specific agents. Successful thr thrombolysis is not a and final treatment and should be complemented in all cases with early angiography uh, performed between 3 and 24 hours after the administration of the lytic and uh, intervention if indicated. All thrombolyzed patients should be transferred immediately to a PCI-capable uh, center to uh, assess the, uh, uh, the state of reperfusion and to perform uh, rescue angioplasty or plan uh, 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 angioplasty 24 hours later. Finally, dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin plus clopidogrel, and parental anticoagulation are recommended in all thrombolyzed patients. Amphitonated heparin, or preferably enoxaparin, should be used with fibrin-specific agents, whereas fondaparinus should be considered with streptokinase. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice presentation and for you keeping time so nicely. So there's t now time for questions from the audience. There's one gentleman over here. Hello, uh, Dr. in the UK. I want to ask about the uh, antiplatelet adjunctive therapy. Um, I understand there's no evidence uh, for the newer antiplatelets with thrombolysis. But there could be confusion. If you have thrombolysis, giving aspirin clopidogrel, then proceed to PCI, what's your strategy? Do you switch to prasugol, to galcalor? Should we, in fact, because there might be resurgence of thrombolysis, actually do newer trials with the new antiplatelets with thrombolysis? Uh, there, there is no evidence so far with uh, new thionoperidines regarding the, uh, in the, in the, in the setting of thrombolysis uh, patients who under one intervention. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, if patients uh, are in a very high risk uh, and re require intervention, you can uh, switch to prasugrel, but there is no evidence so, so far uh, regarding the, the, the benefit of this uh, treatment. But I just can add uh, that uh, so far the companies with, uh, who have uh, put the new anti antiplatelet features on the market, Prasugrel and Anticagrelor, have been reluctant uh, to do large studies uh, with uh, lytic therapy, of course, uh, because of concerns of uh, bleeding risk. That's all I can say for the moment. Yeah, I, I would also add that while I think it's perfectly acceptable to institute Prasugrel or Anticagrelor, after a PCI, which itself may have followed lysis in some patients, once the lytic agent has, the effect of the lytic agent has subsided, I would be concerned with any overlap between the novel agents and lysis in terms of safety, because we really have no information regarding the risk of intracranial hemorrhage when combining either ticagrelor or prasugrel with aspirin and fibrinolytic therapy. And I think there's a serious concern here that we may have an excess 
the potential excess of ICH. The only uh, related experience we have is uh, regarding the use of 2B3A in thrombolyzed patients undergoing intervention. Uh, in the Gracia 3 trial, in these patients, the use of tyrofiban uh, did not uh, uh, improve the outcome of the patients uh, the, 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 with no effect on the endpoints of the of the trial and by contrast produce an uh, an excess no significant excess of, of bleeding a question over here Anna Kalinska from Moscow. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, we should make a decision uh, whether to perform rescue PCI after the 16 uh, minutes from the beginning of the thrombolytic therapy. Uh, and the time of the actilis infusion is 90 minutes. So should we stop the infusion and transfer a patient for the catheter? Uh, this is a very good question. I think that although the uh, optimal time is uh, 60 minutes, I think that 90 minutes is a very good limit because uh, of the, uh, what you said, because of the difficulty to, to assess the perfusion using TPA. Uh, the, problem, the problem is that uh, the, the, the uh, most frequently used uh, fibrin-specific agent today probably is TNK, so uh, it's a little bit different, but uh, 90 minutes is a good limit. Okay, thank you. Back here, please. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Prabhu from Malaysia. Uh, my question is really about the recommendation of uh, Fondaparinox. Uh, we see here that uh, in the OS66 trial that there were some good clinical outcomes concerning Fondaparinox. Is it, uh, my first question is, is it still uh, prefer to use enoxaparin compared to fondaparinox. And number two, in cases where we don't use streptokinase, uh, can we still use fondaparinox as an anticoagulant? Well, uh, the second question uh, is, uh, is uh, very easy to us. In the OSIS-6 uh, trial, patients uh, underwent thrombolysis with different drugs, uh, different to uh, streptokinase, did not have any benefit from this drug. So, uh, enoxaparin is not uh, recommended after uh, uh, the use of uh, streptokinase. And uh, with regard to the first question, uh, can you repeat, please, the first question? Okay. Uh, my first question was... In uh, cases of, sorry, my first question is, is enoxaparin still preferred as an agent compared to fondaparinox generally? I think that depends on, on the lytic. In the case of uh, fibrin-specific lytic, uh, enoxaparin is probably the best option, uh, particularly in patients who are uh, undergoing the pharmacoinvasive strategy, because in these patients is the most uh, uh, experienced uh, ant antithrombotic regimen. And uh, in the case of uh, streptokinase, the best option is, of course, fondaparinus. I am Dr. Chokalingam from India. I'd like to know that for all the presenters, what is the future in the pipeline? Taking the mobile coronary, I mean mobile cath lab to the patient so that we can shorten the PCA even 15 minutes. Okay, so I, I think that this addresses the issue of the choice between lysis and primary PCI, and I think Professor Van der Werf has some comments to make regarding a large trial that he's leading. Well, uh, you, you may know that we, are, we have conducted uh, a large trial comparing standard primary PCI with a pharmacoinvasive uh, strategy. Um, and so I will briefly outline what, what has been done. So patients presenting early, uh, to the ambulance system or to a community hospital with a large infarct, so uh, uh, two or three millimeter ST segment uh, elevations on the ECG. And then they are randomized to standard primary PCI or uh, transport to a PCI center, but uh, with uh, treatment during transport with uh, TNK and oxaparin, uh, clopidogrel, <laughs> And then the patient, when he arrives in the uh, PCI center, is re-evaluated by an ECG, 
and if there is no evidence of reperfusion, a rescue PCI is performed, and if there is evidence of reperfusion, no immediate angiography will be performed or has been performed, but as in the guidelines, uh, an angiogram is performed 3 to 24 hours uh, after uh, the administration of lytic therapy. So this is really a comparison of pharmacoinvasive strategy with primary PCI. We have 1,900 patients uh, recruited, and these data will be presented uh, at the ACC uh, next year. Uh, and this will support what is in the current guidelines, namely that you have to transport the patient who got lytic therapy immediately uh, to a PCI center. And there are not so much data to support this recommendation, and, and hopefully the STREAM trial uh, will support uh, this recommendation. Regarding your question about moving the PCI labs to the, to the patients, we give, do give recommendations about streamlining the pre-hospital care uh, to, to shorten the delays, but also that the PCI centers need a certain volume and, qu and quality in order to uh, perform well. So we give some, some guidance on that. I have a basic question and clarification. All acute infarctions are due to thrombosis over atherosclerosis. Any pharmaco drugs are going to act only on the thrombus lysis, the underlying atheroma of 80, 90, 95 percent, it is going to stay back. By means of simply lysing the thrombus, definitely you are going to save that one. Can't you take more time because the existing a trauma of 80 to 90 percent, we can tackle leisurely. Do you discriminate the two entities? Well, it's of course always, you are correct in your description of the pathophysiology. It's always difficult to translate the pathophysiology into yeah. clinical terms uh, until you've tested that. I think the general outcome of the trials has been that Lytic therapy can take care of the thrombus. Delayed intervention is usually beneficial, and there have been three large, well-conducted, multi-center international studies that have uh, 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 concurred in finding that intervention was beneficial post lysis. There was a lot of debate about the timing, and I think the three recent trials have concurred in having a rather early window of intervention post lysis, although not immediate. Again, it'll be interesting to see the stream trial. There are many other questions. We would like to address as many questions as possible. So many quick questions, quick answers. Yeah. Among, uh, among I am specific agents, which one yeah. we should prepare? I am Dr. Okta Ergen from uh, Turkey, Izmir. Uh, the, uh, the decision of uh, to give primary PCR or fibrinolytic uh, therapy begins uh, with the uh, diagnosis of STEMI or first medical contact. Uh, but the guidelines uh, do not, uh, does not take into account uh, the patient delay. Uh, there may be two patients. Uh, one patient may uh, come to the hospital in 10 minutes or one patient can come to the hospital in two hours. And uh, at the decision point, we have only uh, two hours uh, uh, to decide to give a, a primary PCI or uh, fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, do we have to take into account the uh, patient delay for these patients? For patients uh, with uh, late delay, we can prefer, I think, fibrinolytic therapy. I think that the, the guidelines consider the, the patient delay. In fact, the recommendation for thrombolysis is um, different in patients who are early presenters, in whom the, uh, it's, uh, uh, if the infarction is a very large infarction, uh, probably is preferable than uh, primary PCI unless uh, primary PCI is uh, uh, able to be done very, very early. And uh, by contrast, in patients with uh, more than two hours of delay, uh, the decision of uh, PCI or thrombolysis depend on the possibility of, uh, of performing uh, PCI uh, in uh, less than uh, two hours and preferably 90 minutes. Dr. Gorslik is in front here and wants to make a yeah, comment or just, a question. Uh, as a member of this committee, I just wanted to make a quick point of clarification. You remember that as far as uh, 
rescue PCI was concerned, there were two trials. One was REACT and one was Merlin, and they differed in a number of ways. The two important ways was that there was much more use of intravenous 2B3A in Merlin, and a higher instance of intracranial hemorrhage, so I support Gabriel Steg and others' belief that we don't have evidence for these more potent antiplatelet therapies, so I would recommend that we stay with the clopidogrel. And secondly, the difference was in the estimation of the time of the ECG resolution, and in Merlin it was 60 minutes, and in REACT it was 90 minutes. So any time between those times is probably more appropriate, and according to the lytic you're using. So they used streptokinase, uh, we used uh, TPA. Thank you for that comment. Among the Everything Among is the... relatively clear with adjunctive antithrombotic treatment in case of lytic. But in second st stage of pharmacoinvasive approach, I mean PCI, is it any place for n new oral antiplatelet agents? What about 2B3A blockers? At what type of anticoagulation? And the same question about rescue PCI. In the, in the case of uh, post lysis uh, plan uh, PCI, there is no place uh, for new uh, uh, antiplatelet therapies according to the evidence so far. Uh, in fact, as uh, uh, um, uh, uh, mentioned before, the companies are even reluctant to the use of these uh, drugs because of the risk of bleeding. According to that, the experience of the, our experience with the use of 2B3A inhibitors in this, in this setting is, not, uh, is neutral or even uh, negative according to the fact that uh, uh, these uh, agents uh, produce no benefit on outcomes, produce no benefit on myocardial perfusion, no benefit on uh, the evolution of the, of the lesion, uh, the culprit lesion, and on, by contrast, uh, are associated with that trend towards uh, more bleeding. Among the fibrin one, one, one final question from the back here. We need to move on later. Among the fibrin-specific agents, which one we should prefer? Among the fibrin-specific agents, yeah. I think that uh, TNK is the preferable if you want to perform a lysis very quickly in the emergency room or the, in the ambulance. And because uh, the uh, benefit on non-cerebral bleeding and the, the need of uh, transfusion. I, th I think that TNK is, is uh, more beneficial in this uh, regard and is very, very easy to administer. So uh, it's, it's ideal for administration in the pre-hospital setting and in the, in the emergency room. Thank you. Okay, the last set of recommendations relates to uh, management and therapies after the acute phase, and this will be presented by uh, Dr. Valdemar Miklia from Italy. Thank you very much, Professor van der Werf, Stefan, Gabriel. It's a pleasure for me on behalf of the whole ESC uh, Task Force Committee on STEMI guidelines to walk you through subsequent management and therapies, which is basically referring to section number four and five of current guidelines. These are my disclosures. So let's kick off from logistical issues during a hospital stay. The first recommendation uh, says that all hospitals participating in the care of STEMI should have a coronary care unit equipped to provide all aspects of care for STEMI patients, including treatment of ischemia, severe heart failure, arrhythmias, and common comorbidities, class one level of evidence C. This specific recommendation clearly and largely refer to a previous ESC report, which was published in the European Art Journal in 2005, where you can find in a very detailed manner all recommendation for structure, organization, and operation in intensive care unit. Two different formula are provided here to quantify the number of needed beds and also there is a clear description in terms of CCU equipment and the need for continuous monitor of the patients. 
With respect to hospitalization and length of stay in the different setting of the hospital, uh, the, these guidelines actually put forward some new recommendations. Specifically, length of stay in the CCU, patients undergoing uncomplicated, successful reperfusion therapy should be kept in the coronary care unit for a minimum of 24 hours, which is at variance with previous ESC guidelines, after which they may be moved to a step-down monitor bed or in a different setting provided telemetry is in place, class 1 level of evidence C. Also, there is quite a clear opening towards transferring back the patient after PCI has been accomplished to non-PCI hospital. Early transfer, same day, may be considered in selected low-risk patients after successful primary PCI without observed arrhythmias to BC. And finally, at hospital discharge, again, a new recommendation is provided here, early discharge meaning after approximately 72 hours is reasonable in selected low-risk patients if early rehab and adequate follow-up are arranged to be B. Importantly, in these guidelines, you will find additional information on how the selection criteria for identifying low-risk patients for early discharge can be uh, pulled together. And today, you have basically two uh, options. Both have been prospectively validated. The PAMI-2 criteria, which are listed here, or you may want to use the SFOLE criteria. The SFOLE risk score has been well described and uh, established in the past. Here you see the variables which are uh, composing the score, KILIP class, Timiflow after procedure, age, three vessel disease in a dummy manner, anterior MI, yes, no, and ischemic time more than four hours. Provided the total uh, SFOLE criteria is equal or less than three, it may be reasonable to proceed towards an early discharge. Summary of indication for imaging and stress testing. Recommendations here for your uh, benefit are divided into at presentation, after the acute phase, and before or after discharge. At presentation, in the acute phase, when diagnose is uncertain, emergency echo may be useful. However, if inconclusive or unavailable or persistent doubts are there, emergency angiography should be considered class 1C. And the key message here, of course, is that echo could be a valuable tool for making a clear diagnosis, but in no manner that should delay the proceed to uh, revascularization. During the acute phase, all patients should have an echo for assessment of infarct size and resting LV function, 1B. Again, a new recommendation, if echo is not feasible or available, whatever, MRI may be used as an alternative to BC. Finally, before or after discharge, for patients with multivessel disease or in whom revascularization of other vessels is considered, stress testing or imaging, and here a list is given for ischemia and viability is indicated 1A. Finally, computer tomography and geography has no role in the routine management of STEMI, class 3C, as if anything may only reproduce the anatomic information which have already been provided by angiography, which is supposed to, be, to have been performed uh, before. Quickly through routine therapies in the acute, subacute, and long-term phase of STEMI. Active smokers with STEMI must receive counseling and be referred to a smoking cessation program, 1B, consistent with previous guidelines, but there is an extra recommendation here. Each hospital participating in the care of STEMI patients must have a smoking cessation protocol, 1C. And you may find many additional information to back up this recommendation. In summary here, what the guidelines are saying is that observational studies show that patients who stop smoking reduce their mortality in the succeeding years compared to patients who continue smoking. Stop smoking is potentially the most effective of all secondary prevention measures and much effort should be devoted to this end. Patients do not smoke during the acute phase of a STEMI and a convalescent period is ideal for health professionals to help smokers to quit. However, assumption of smoking is common after discharge and continued support 
and advice are needed during the rehab. Nicotine replacement, bupropion, and antidepressants may be useful. Nicotine patches have been demonstrated to be safe in SES patients. Exercise-based rehab is recommended in all patients, 1B. Antiplatelet therapy with low dose aspirin, 75 up to 100 mg, is indicated indefinitely after STEMI, 1A, multiple evidence here. In patients who are intolerant to aspirin, clopidogrel is indicated as an alternative to aspirin, 1B, entirely based on the results of the Capri study. DAPT, DAPT with a combination of aspirin and prasugar or aspirin and ticagor is recommended over aspirin and clopidogrel in patients treated with PCI, 1A. DAPT with aspirin and an oral ADP receptor blocker must be continued for up to 12 months after STEMI with a strict minimum duration of one month for patients receiving bare metal stent, 1C, six months for patients receiving DS, 2B, B. And this is a new recommendation from the present guidelines. This new recommendation is entirely based on the evidence which is summarized here. Two uh, new studies have been released since the last version of the guidelines, the excellent and the prodigy study. Unfortunately, the proportion of STEMI patients in the first study is extremely limited, 3.1. STEMI patients are more represented in the prodigy study, which was aiming to an Alcamer patient population. The excellent was aiming for non inferiority of 12 month DPT over the six months, and inferiority was achieved with respect to the primary endpoint, which was target vessel failure. Prodigy was aiming to show superiority of long versus short, and this superiority could not be demonstrated. Importantly, in the Prodigy study, there was a significant increase of bleeding complication in the long-term DAPT group, which was irrespective of the bleeding scale which was employed in the study. In patients with left ventricular thrombus, anticoagulation should be instituted for a minimum of three months to AB. No specific randomized studies are available here, but this recommendation is largely available on uh, retrospective data and registries. Then in patients with a clear indication for oral anticoagulation, for example, atrial fibrillation with chat VASC equal or greater than two, or patients uh, with mechanical valve, oral anticoagulation must be implemented in addition to antiplatelet therapy, 1C. In patients requiring triple antithrombotic therapy, combining DPT with an oral anticoagulant agent because of stent placement and an obligatory indication for the drug, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy should be minimized to reduce the bleeding risk, 1C. In selected patients who receive aspirin, and clopidogrel, low dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 mg twice a day, may be considered in if the patient is at low risk for bleeding to BB. And this is again a new recommendation from these guidelines, which is entirely based on one single study, which is summarized here in front of you the Atlas 2 TIMI 51 study, which was comparing in a heterogeneous ACS patient population, which was importantly including STEMI in as many as almost 50% of the cases, placebo versus rivaroxaban tested at two different regimen. Here you see the results for the primary point when the two doses were clustered together. There was a significant reduction of the primary and point of CV death MI stroke, including ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, with the 16% relative risk reduction and an absolute difference of 1.7% which leads to a number needed to treat in the range of 60. If you specifically focus on the ischemic benefit of the lower dose which was employed in the study, you see the 2.5 milligram rivaroxaban was able to reduce the primary composite endpoint which came along with the significant reduction of cardiovascular death and all cause mortality with the number needed to treat indeed very favorable for the use of the drug. 
At subgroup analysis, there was no clear signal for inconsistency of the, frag, of the effect of the drug across all tested covariates. And importantly, here you see that there was no significant interaction in patients receiving aspirin monotherapy or patients receiving aspirin and a PTY12 receptor blocker. There is a signal towards an increased efficacy here. However, the aspirin monotreated patients were relatively small in the study, confidence interval were wide, and there is a huge overlap. So no clear indication from the subgroup analysis is emerging on which patient population should best be treated with this uh, uh, anticoagulant option. Concerning, of course, is the safety endpoints of the study. There is a systematic increase of timinone cabbage and later major bleeding complication with both doses. There is a clear dose-dependent effect here. Again, a dose-dependent effect on intracranial hemorrhage. And importantly, the low dose, which is the only one recommended in a selective manner by the guidelines, is not associated to a significant increase in fatal bleeding complications. Finally, DAPT should be used up to one year in patients with STEMI who did not receive a stent to AC. Gastric protection with a PPI should be considered for the duration of DAPT therapy in patients at high risk of bleeding, no evidence, class of recommendation to A. Routine therapies in the acute, subacute, and long term phase of STEMI. Oral treatment with beta blockers should be considered during a hospital stay, a continued thereafter in all STEMI patients without contraindications. 2AB, and this is a downgrade with respect to previous STEMI guidelines, which is justified in the text as follow. The benefit of long-term treatment with beta blockers after STEMI is not is well established, although mostly from trials predating the advent or, of modern reperfusion therapy and pharmacotherapy. In contemporary trials using primary PCI, beta blockers have not been investigated, although it is not unreasonable to extrapolate their benefit to this setting. Oral beta blockers are indicated with a class 1A indication in patients with R failure or LV dysfunction. Intravenous beta blockers should be avoided in patients with hypotension or heart failure 3B based on the result of the COMMIT study. A fasting lipid profile must be obtained in all STEMI patients as soon as possible, 1C. It is recommended to initiate or continue IDOS uh, statins early after administ admission in all STEMI patients without contraindication or history of intolerance, regardless of initial cholesterol value, 1A. And also this recommendation has been modified. Reassessment of LDL cholesterol should be considered after four to six weeks to make sure that the target value of 70 milligram per deciliter of LDL in each single STEMI case has been reached. And this is at variance with previous STEMI guidelines, which were recommending to aim at 100. 2AC. There is a huge large paragraph in the guidelines uh, justifying this change in the recommendation. Very quickly, the benefits of statins in secondary prevention have been unequivocally demonstrated and specific studies have demonstrated their benefit of early and in intensive statin therapy. The recent meta-analysis of trials comparing more versus less intensive LDL cholesterol lowering with statins indicated that compared with less intensive regimens, more intensive statins in therapy produced reductions in the risk of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and ischemic stroke and coronary vascularization. For every one millimole per liter reduction in LDL cholesterol, these further reduction risks were similar to the proportional reductions of the trials of statin versus control. Therefore, statins should be given to all patients with acute MI, irrespective of cholesterol concentration. This treatment should be started early during admission, as this increases patients' adherence after discharge, and given at high doses, as this is associated with early and sustained clinical benefit. Finally, verapamil may be considered for secondary prevention in patients who have absolute contraindication to beta blockers. ACE inhibitors, 1A. Angiotensin receptor antagonists, preferably 
Valsartan, based on the result of the Valiant study, is an alternative to ACE inhibitors in patients with heart failure or LV systolic dysfunction. ACE inhibitors should be considered in all patients in the absence of contraindication, not just in patients with heart failure with a lower level of recommendation, 2A instead of 1. And finally, aldosterone antagonism, a plerone, should also be given provided these variables are satisfied. The Jackson fraction lower than 40, uh, diabetes, heart failure, uh, or uh, absence of hyperkalemia, 1B. Very quickly, complication following STEMI, I think in the same, in the, for the sake of time, we should focus on KILIP class 4, treatment of cardiogenic shock. Oxygen, mechanical respiratory support is indicated among, uh, according to blood gases, 1C. Urgent echo-doppler must be performed to detect mechanical complications, assess systolic function and loading condition, 1C. IREX patient must be transferred early to uh, referral centers, 1C. Emergent, emergency revascularization with either PCI or cabbage in suitable patients must be considered, 1B. Lysis should be considered if revascularization, mechanical revascularization is not an option to AC. Intraortic balloon pumping may be considered to be B. And also this is a downgrade of recommendation with respect to previous guidelines which were advocating the use of the ABP with the class 1C uh, recommendation. This change is justified as follows. Evidence regarding its efficacy, of course the topic is intraortic balloon pump, in the setting of acute MI, complicated by cardiogenic shock, has been reviewed recently for patients in the pre-fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic and primary PCI eras. Owing to the lack of randomized studies, only registries were evaluated and showed conflicting results for the three eras with mortality risk differences of 29 and 18% in favor of in, uh, balloon pump in the pre-thrombolytic and thrombolytic eras and an increase of 6% in mortality with intraortic balloon pump in the primary PCI era. Another recent meta-analysis suggests a survival benefit from EABP in patients with cardiogenic shock. Overall, despite common use in clinical practice, there is somewhat conflicting evidence with respect to the benefit of EABP in cardiogenic shock, which is probably largely related to the difficulty of performing randomized studies in this specific setting. Uh, Marco, we will need to conclude very quickly. Okay. Uh, very quickly, LVAD is a second choice, and of course you have uh, available choice for uh, vasopressor. We can skip management of atrial fibrillation, not surprisingly, as uh, in the past these guidelines is uh, overwhelmed with C level of evidence which highlights the need for further research, and the last section of the guidelines is a section entirely devoted to highlight the major gaps in evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to highlight that uh, there will be a Meet the Task Force session tomorrow morning so that all of you who have questions can come and meet the Task Force and meet several of us at 10 o'clock, at 10.10 in the Tirana room tomorrow morning. Have a good morning. <laughs>